So good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming to this talk towards the end of the conference. Um, my name is Sonika Jari. I lead the quantum applications team at IonQ. Um, and I'm going to talk today about a project uh, that IonQ did uh, jointly with the Fidelity Center for Applied Technology, in, the, in which we applied uh, machine learning to a problem in finance, and we found evidence for uh, exponential advantage with quantum computers. Um, so begin, to begin with, since we're a public company now, I have to, the lawyers have told me that I have to put up this display, uh, this uh, statement in, in, before I start any talk. And if you want, uh, you want to read this in detail, this is on the website. Okay, so uh, with that, let me begin. Um, so IMQ is a trapped ion quantum computing company. Our uh, qubits consist of ions um, that are trapped by an electric field on top of a trapped ion chip. Um, the, uh, the qubits uh, are, uh, the quantum computation is done with the help of lasers. So at the beginning of the computation, the qubits are initialized in the zero state by a laser. Then uh, the quantum computation consists of several gates that form, uh, that form a quantum circuit. And these gates are executed again by lasers that act on the target qubits. And then at the end of the computation, the qubits are projected out into a classical zero or one state. And this readout at the end is again done by a laser beam, just like that. Um, next, over here, uh, here is a video that uh, one of my colleagues took of 25 ions in a chain. Now, in our current architecture, uh, you can see that the ions are read up in a linear array. Despite this, uh, you can perform entangling gates between any two qubits in this array. And as any quantum programmer will tell you, that this can make the ability to do all, uh, to, to, to do entangling gates between any two qubits, uh, which is also known as auto all connectivity, can make all of the differences in getting out complete noise in the end versus getting out something actually useful for, uh, for a current generation of quantum computers. Um, there are several reasons uh, why uh, trapped ions are uniquely suited for quantum computing. So the first uh, uh, reason is that uh, all of our qubits are identical, right? So nature has given every atom uh, to be the, exactly the same as every other atom of the same kind. So we are not plagued by many of the fabrication errors that, uh, uh, that uh, many of the solid state technologies are hampered by, especially in terms of reproducibility and scaling of qubit number. Um, the, since the, the trapped ions are, are suspended above the trapped ion ship, they are far away uh, enough from any of the defects and impurities in the solid state substrate that they're not really affected by them significantly. Very, very importantly, they are capable of running at close to room temperature. So you don't need to stick your qubits into a giant dilution refrigerator, which is hungry for the world's limited supply of helium. Um, uh, like I mentioned there, the qubits are, our qubits are highly connected, extremely important for running algorithms, and also reconfigurable. The systems, you can choose how many qubits you want to load and so on. Um, inherently, they have very high quality gates. And also, they have, uh, they have the longest qubit lifetime, right? So this is the same technology on which uh, atomic clocks are based, right? And th those set the very standard of time. So for a number of reasons, right? Um, uh, right now, I think there's no question. If you're a quantum algorithms person, quantum applications person, I don't think there's any other technology you can turn to and say that it would give you the same performance for running applications and algorithms. So uh, with that setting the stage, uh, let me talk about a quantum applications project. Um, uh, the details of my talk uh, are present, uh, present in this paper uh, on Abishnan Archive. It's called Generative Quantum Learning of Joint Probability Distribution Functions. I highly encourage pe people who are interested in the details to go and look at it after the talk. So uh, let me dive in. So, uh, uh, and my talk, you know, it's going to be fairly technical, but uh, I hope I can get the message across to those of you who are not so in the weeds of quantum computing as well. So let me begin my talk uh, with motivating uh, why we want to study joint probability distributions or why we want to do multivariate analysis, right? So basically, uh, multivariate analysis is, uh, you know, it's a science of understanding the statistical relationship between 
several random variables, and it is really critical to if you are in any uh, kind of position where you're doing uh, database analysis or decision making, you want to understand how several variables re relate to each other, right? Um, and you know, it, whether you're working risk management, you have a job in finance, some, you're doing engineering reliability analysis, climate research, you're in the medical field, you want to be able to do, uh, to understand multivariate distributions, right? And uh, the problem is that uh, th this can actually be quite complex. So if you, uh, you know, if, if you think, just think about like, uh, you know, if you want to study how two stocks are correlated to each other, you don't, uh, you, you cannot really use just, a, you cannot really use just a single parameter to ca capture the co correlation. So single parameter corla correlation function would just be like fitting a straight line to, to uh, distribution of stock prices, right? And that's not really good enough. What you want to understand is the point-wise correlation structure of, of the distribution. And this is especially important in, uh, in data sets like, such as those from financial markets in which uh, maybe there is very low correlation in the bulk of the distribution, but there is a high dependence and extreme deviations. So, you know, when there's a black swan event, there's correlation, even if there's normally not any correlation. So um, here's an example uh, of what I was talking about uh, regarding multivariate distributions. So here is just a, a visualization as a, as a scatter plot of the returns uh, on the stock prices of Apple and Microsoft over several years. Um, and uh, uh, on the left, uh, you, I, what I, there's, a, there's a quantity I want to define, which is called the mar marginal distribution. So if you have a, a distribution of, sev uh, of several variables, if you integrate out all of the variables except one, what you get are one, these 1D distributions. These are called marginal distributions, and I'll be talking about that, them extensively in the uh, remaining part of the talk. So how do, now how do, you, study, uh, how, how do you study these multivariate distributions? A popular way of doing that is uh, via copulas. Now this is going to be the most technical slide in my talk. I apologize for that, but you know it really sets the stage for what's coming ahead. So I hope uh, you know. Please bear bear with me. So copulas are uh, multivariate cumulative density functions of uniform marginals. What does that mean? So they're again uh, they're again uh, multivariate distributions. So they're distributions of more than one variable, with the condition that the marginal distributions that I defined <coughs> in the previous slide. Right, they're the distributions of each individual uh, variable taken by itself, right? With the condition that those marginal distributions are uniform, and so why are these important? They're important because what they allow you to do is, if you're given any arbitrary probability, you know, multivariate probability distribution, they allow these copula functions. What they allow you to do is, is they allow uh, uh, what they allow you to do is separate the correlation uh, correlation function from the marginal distribution. Right? So they allow you to express a joint probability distribution as uniform mar marginals that have no correlation plus some function which couples them together. And uh, you know the way that you get these uniform marginals from an arbitrary probability distribution is you do this thing called a probability integral transform, <coughs> which uh, is basically you integrate uh, uh, the marginals to get this uh, CDF. And that CDF is uniformly distributed. And then there's a theorem that says that uh, you can do this for any general distribution. Um, and the important insight that we have in this paper is, so this copula is a very fundamental thing in probability theory, right? And what we realized is that copulas can be represented by maximally entangled quantum states, right? So that was pretty new. Nobody had realized it before. But, but we, we kind of did that in this paper, and that's, uh, you know, that's, we think that's going to have a pretty big impact. So if you now if you go off and look, uh, you know you look at, at copula copulas on Wikipedia's uh, on Wikipedia, you'll see a bunch of different applications. They're used in finance, they're used in engineering, they're used in climate science, they're used in medicine, they're used in signal processing, and so on. Right. So very very widely used. And so if you can show that quantum computers are useful for the study of copulas, you immediately find applications of copulas and uh, application of quantum computers in all of these different areas. Right. Now, again, if you look on Wikipedia, what you realize is that usually the way people use copula functions 
is they identify some function. So you have some data set, right? You identify a function that seems to fit that data set well, right? And then, uh, then uh, you select that function, you fit it, you fit that function to the data set, and then you use it for analysis, right? And, the, uh, and most of the widely used copula functions, they try to capture the correlation structure of the data with one or maybe you know, just a few parameters. Now, what's the problem with that, right? Uh, why do these traditional copula methods fail? So here is uh, an example, right? So this is a scatter plot of asset returns, right? And uh, one of the most popular copula functions is this Gaussian copula. Um, and people use it because it's tractable. So tractable means it's easy to work with, right? But the problem is that it misses rare events, right? So uh, uh, it captures the bulk of the distribution well, but it does not really make, uh, a, you know, it, it basically predicts almost no events in the tail of the distribution. And why is that a problem? Now, uh, if you go back and uh, look at many of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, if you if you go and look, uh, if you go back and look at history, there's many many examples of uh, where rare events have had uh, have, have caused problems. So rare events are rare, you know, they happen infrequently, but they can have a, they can have an outsized impact, right? So for instance, the use of the Gaussian copula function, right? It's a very simple classical copula function. It is actually blamed uh, for causing the 2009 financial crash. And more recently, Zillow, right, um, they had to close down one of their major business units because the algorithm they were using for uh, pricing houses could not handle the uncertainty that was caused by the black swan event that was the pandemic, right? So, you know, important to be able to model multivariate distributions well, including predicting rare events, right? Or at least not, uh, you can't predict rare events, but accounting for the uncertainty from rare events. So how do you fix this, right? So one way to do it is just move to more and more sophisticated copula functions, you go from you know Gaussian copulas to Archimedean, et cetera, et cetera. But the problem there is that uh, scaling up these uh, copula functions to more than just a few variables is extremely inefficient. Right, um, so people don't really use that, really do that. They, they stick with like the simple popular functions. The other way, more modern way, is to do generative machine learning on it, right? So uh, in generative machine learning, typically what people do is they use a neural network, right? As a, as a gen, uh, you know, they train a neural network to learn to, re uh, to, learn to produce samples from, uh, from a given data set. And then this, uh, you know, this neural network is tra often trained by something called a GAN or a generative adversarial network, where a generator and a discriminator play a zero sum game. The generator is trying to uh, produce samples that look like the real samples, and the discriminator is trying to, uh, you know, uh, differentiate between samples produced by the generator and the real data. Right. So uh, this is the architecture of a GAN. Right, so you have this uh, classical neural network, which is the generator, another neural network that is the discriminator, and uh, there's a zero sum game being played by the two. Okay, what we did here is instead of using, uh, sorry, instead of using a classical neural network as a generator, we decided to see if using a quantum uh, circuit as a generator has any advantage. Right. And so then the question is, okay, fine, here's an idea. Let's say, you know, uh, this, this classical neural network, uh, uh, let's replace it by a quantum circuit, but what should the quantum circuit look like, right? So, um, uh, you know, we want to use a quantum circuit to model correlations between two or more variables. So what should this quantum generator look like? Okay, so what's the simplest, uh, uh, simplest uh, correlated object in quantum mechanics? It's a bell pair, right? Um, and you know how to create bell pairs extremely easily with, on a quantum computer. All you need is this Hadamard gate and a C0 gate, right? So now, uh, now let's extend that, uh, extend that part a bit, right? Let's say you want to model two random variables, and you have uh, you have some given number of qubits. What you do is you divide those qubits into two parts, right? So you divide them in, you assign them to two registers, and you create the, a number of bell pairs. That, uh, that span the two registers, right? And what that gives you is a perfectly correlated, a perfect, two perfectly correlated uniform distributions. So whatever you measure in register A, you will get the exact same thing in register B at the end of this quantum circuit. 
And uh, you also have the condi what you also get is that each, if you look at the distribution of the states you get in register A just by itself, that's going to be uniform, right? Okay, so this function, uh, you know, at the end of this, uh, um, at the end of this circuit, the quantum circuit state that you measure is going to be a copula. It's a very boring copula, right? Uh, you know, the, the the individual probability distributions or marginals are uniformly distributed. Right? It's a boring copula because it's perfectly correlated. Whatever you value is for variable one, it's the same value for variable two. Right? Now, uh, let's try and make it a bit more interesting. Let's see what happens when you also do local operations on register A and local operations on register B. Right? So uh, before, before you apply the local uh, operations, like I said, you have uniform distributions in register A and uniform in register B. So uniform distribution is just represented by, by an identity matrix with some uh, normalization factor. And when you apply unitaries locally to each register, the interesting thing is that this uniform distribution does not change, right? And uh, it, remains, it remains an identity matrix in each register. But what does change is the correlations between register A and B. And so this state at the end of this circuit is nothing but a quantum representation of a copula function. And I'm really proud to say that we have labeled this a copula with the key, right? Um, so that was kind of fun. Um, but, uh, but uh, so this is cool, right? So now, you know, uh, we, we realize that, uh, you know, copulas can be represented by maximally entangled quantum states. We also found a way to kind of uh, uh, manufacture those quantum states. And next, what you can do is this UA and UB, you know, I've just stuck them on here, not specified what they look like. What you can do is you can say that this U, those U's, right, you can, uh, you can specify them with, uh, you can construct them with some quantum gates that have free parameters that can be optimized, right, during, during some kind of machine learning uh, training, right? So, uh, so you've turned, you've basically now got a variational quantum circuit that represents a copula function, and that can then be trained to uh, to mimic the properties of a given distribution. So, with that, all that theoretical background in place, we then uh, we then applied it to a real data set. So, uh, the first figure here is the growth of capital if invested in you know Apple or, or Microsoft stocks, and then the returns of that uh, returns of those stocks are presented as a scatter plot here. And then that probability integral transform that I was talking about, it takes you from this uh, scatter plot in what I call real space to copula space, right? Um, and, and so what you want your quantum machine learning algorithm to do is to, uh, is to mimic this probability distribution or be able to produce samples that look like they are from this probability distribution on the right over here, right? Okay. So here are, uh, here are details of our technical work, right? So we compared classical machine learning, which is the first <coughs> column here, with uh, quantum machine learning algorithms. One was the QGAN, the quantum version of a GAN, and also a quantum circuit born machine, right? And so what we did was, uh, you know, in order to compare apples to apples, we made sure that the number of free parameters in the classical GAN is the same as the number of uh, free parameters in the quantum models, right? And uh, the first very interesting thing we find out is that the learning seems to be robust to small amounts of noise, right? So this on the left here is the training of the, uh, of the quantum GAN in simulation on an ideal simulator. And you find that uh, uh, on the ideal simulator, so the blue curve is the loss function of the generator, orange curve is the loss function of the generator, of the dis uh, discriminator in the GAN. And what happens is that when you start the training, the two diverge, and then after some time they converge, and that's your aha moment when you know that your model has been trained. And so what happens when you go from simulation to experiment, so this is uh, these actually results from our last generation quantum computer, you find that uh, you know uh, the simulator, you converge around 300 iterations. The, the experiment, you converge around five, four or 500 iterations, right? So all that the noise does is it delays, it delays the convergence, right? It does not destroy, it does not take away quantum advantage. Of course, if you had too much noise, it would never converge at all. But it is robust to small amounts of noise, right? Okay. 
Then here are the results uh, of the training, right? So the first thing you find is that the quantum algorithms, uh, so the, this is result for six qubits, right? So the quantum algorithms outperform the classical algorithms, even on six qubits, right? So you, so you have to remember here that the classical and quantum models have the same number of parameters. And the quantum, uh, quantum uh, uh, models in experiment on the cloud quantum computer reach a lower value of this parameter called the kolmogorov gorov smirnov distance than the, uh, than the classical models. So they outperform them in mimicking the, the target data set. They also converge, quantum models converge 100% of the time, whereas the classical GAN only converges about 40% of the time. Next, you observe that the quantum models learn much more efficiently. So on the bottom here, you see uh, that the, you know, the leftmost uh, 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 plot is for the target data set, and then you, and the rest of them are the tra uh, you know, trainings by the different models, uh, sorry, the outcomes of trainings by the different models. And the, the classical uh, GAN took uh, 20,000 iterations to converge, right? And the quantum GAN only took 1,000, and then the, the quantum circuit board machine took only about 20 iterations to converge, right? So they train much, much, much faster. Then thirdly, you see that, uh, you know, just, just do a you know, visual check of the kind of data that was generated by the train model. So the classical GAN, it looks kind of weird, right? Like it misses everything in the tail of the distribution. And the quantum models are actually much better at uh, producing samples that are in the tails of the distributions. So they can, uh, you know, which goes to say they can account for uncertainty that can come from rare events, right? And we are currently, you know, we are currently doing research that uh, improves these models even more, right? So, so this is not the end of the story. I think you're just going to do much, much better than it this even. Okay, so, uh, so, you know, I gave you the theory. I gave you the results of uh, the practical experiment we did. And then, you know, uh, uh, looking towards the future, what is, you know, why should we use this algorithm? Is there any proof that we have of quantum advantage? And yes, we do. So the, quant the, the arguments for quantum advantage in the model, right, um, the first argument is the hardness of sampling from quantum circuits. So we know that the space of uh, probability distributions that can be modeled efficiently quantumly is much larger than the space of the probability distributions that can be modeled efficiently classically. Right. So that is the first argument for exponential quantum advantage. The second advantage comes from Bell's theorem. Right. So with Bell's theorem, um, uh, let's say you have a one, uh, one, Q, uh, one Bell pair, right, and you distribute it to two uh, people, or in this case, two registers A and B. You know that uh, the correlations between these two qubits cannot be reproduced by a classical theory. Uh, with no communication between those registers, right? Now extend this to n qubits, right? So if you have n qubits that are distributed between two registers A and B, the the uh, the correlations, right? Which is the you know we are trying to capture correlation structure between two variable, two or more variables. Those correlations require an exponential amount of communication between A and B to reproduce, right? And then you can take that argument and stick it into your machine learning algorithm and basically argue that if your classical generator was a feed-forward neural network, right, the number of layers it has has to scale exponentially in N in order to reproduce the correlations that the quantum generator can, can uh, the quantum generator can, uh, uh, can generate efficiently, right? So, uh, you know, so, so we expect to have quantum advantage in this exponential quantum advantage in this model, and we expect this, uh, you know, that advantage. Um, as you increase the number of variables, it should it, you should get more and more advantage over the classical uh, classical learning models. Okay, so finally, I'll end uh, with an outlook. So, um, you know, the take-home messages are, um, you know, the application areas for calculus are extremely broad in financial. In the financial industry, you know whether you're doing some kind of engineering reliability analysis, you're looking at you know trying to sell more ads, you're trying to do climate research, you're working in medicine. So extremely, you know, it's, you know it's a concept that has extremely wide applicability. 
And then quantum mod uh, models are much more efficient representations of cochlear functions, right? Um, and they can really uh, efficiently reproduce probability dis uh, distributions that can capture key uh, features of the training data set. And we do believe that this could be an area for first practical quantum advantage. So with that, I'll end and happy to take any questions. Just to understand it, so you put those unitaries to decouple the distributions, right? And and those those unitaries U A and U B they get trained during the iteration. Exactly. And so if you have three of them, so only thing you have to do is just train those three unitaries. Yes. As compared to eight of them in the classical, and that's the source of the. Uh, no. Uh, so uh, over here, so if you have three of them, so you know if you have three variables and you have n qubits per variable, right? So um, expon uh, classically, you would have to have, you know, the, the classical neural network would have to scale as uh, 2 to the m times n, where m is the number of variables and n is the number of qubits. So in a classical neural network, the number of layers is proportional to the number of variables you have to train, right? So you would have exponentially more variables to train on the, on the classical side versus the quantum side. Other questions? Please. Thanks saying that a little bit. Do you have any like reasoning why the onset states that you can create will be able to explore the exponentially larger space compared to the classical? So, so uh, you know, th there are proofs for sam. Uh, so there are proofs that uh, for hardness of sampling quantum circuits. And the choice of ansatz that we made, right, you can prove that sampling from it is inefficient for classical computers. Anything else? Any other questions? All right, thank I you. I guess so. that's time.